Welcome to The New Paradigm for Mankind, a weekly discussion between Lyndon LaRouche and his scientific associates in which we investigate the true nature of the creative human mind and the ideas necessary for the progress of mankind. Hello. Today is July 9th, 2014. My name is Megan Beats, and I'll be your host for this week. I'm joined in the studio today by Leona Fancheng and Benjamin Denniston of the LaRouche Pack Scientific Research Team. Now, just to say a few things to set the context for today's discussion and what you're going to be getting into, Ben, um, let me just say that the recent weeks have been a complete and total acceleration in the breakdown of the British Empire system and the coming into being of a potentially new replacement world system. Now this is occurring mainly on two fronts at this point. First of all was is uh, the June 16th ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court, which upheld an earlier ruling of a U.S. Uh, federal district court that mandated that the nation of Argentina submit and pay over one, I think it's one and a half billion dollars to the vulture funds. Um, now, these, these are typified by the NML capital of Paul Singer, who are demanding over a 1,600% return on their so-called mm. investment into Argentine bonds. This is the, the vulture fund of Paul Singer, who's responsible for genocide in the Congo based on a similar policy. Mm. Now, the Supreme Court order is ordering Argentina to pay. Now, naturally, Argentina is saying, no, we're a sovereign nation, and we're not going to lay down and die and become a carcass to support a genocidal world financial system. Now, the response from the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world, has been one of solidarity. You saw the support of the G77 nations. We saw the support of most of the heads of state of the BRICS nations. We saw the support uh, last week, last Thursday, a vote of support from the nations of the Organization of American States with the uh, notable exception of the United States and Canada. So what we're talking about is roughly 80% of the world population represented by these nations is backing Argentina in uh, a move of solidarity, recognizing that if Argentina is allowed to fall, their nation, the rest of the world is next. Now, what's forming in this context is the emergence of a potential new world system. And we'll see uh, later this week and next week with the visits of President Putin of Russia and President Xi of China visiting South America and meeting with Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner of Argentina. These are nations which are currently pursuing development policies of rail development, investment into resource development, and the recognition of a pursuit of a physical economic policy. Now, as Mr. LaRouche has emphasized, this is a gr has been a grave miscalculation on the part of the empire because obviously they're not coming from a point of strength. This is a desperate move from a collapsing system to implement their bail-in policy of, of exacting payment and collapsing the economies of nations to try to maintain their system. Now, this is a complete miscalculation also on the part of the Obama administration which allowed the Supreme Court ruling to go forward and is thereby placing, the Obama presidency is placing itself on the side of a genocidal world empire up against 80% or more of the world's population. Now, this brings us to the other front uh, which we're seeing unfolding in these weeks and, and we'll see unfolding dramatically in the weeks ahead, which is obviously not separate, which is the growing environment in the United States for Obama's impeachment. And we've seen this in the recent revelations of Hillary Clinton, as reported in Ed Klein's book, that Obama was the source of the lies and the cover-up around the 2012 Benghazi attacks and the death of four Americans, that Obama is the source of the cover-up of gun running from northern Africa into Syria and other parts of the Middle East. We're seeing a growing and potentially very interesting backlash against Obama's uh, unilaterally sending troops, U.S. armed troops, on the ground in Iraq to supposedly advise the Iraqi government while discussing overthrowing it uh, mm -hmm. as we arm al-Qaeda in the Middle East. So 
this is what you're seeing embodied in these motions of Obama and to which we're getting growing resistance is the empire policy to start World War III. That's the empire's only option, is to overthrow civilization, start thermonuclear world war. Now, as LaRouche has said in recent days, look, Obama is not long for this presidency. This is the end of the Obama administration. It is guaranteed. And that means this is the end of this empire. But the question is, will civilization emerge on the other side? And that's what we're here to discuss today. The only way that's going to happen is if the U.S. Congress takes measures in the immediate period for the impeachment and removal of Obama, if the United States joins in the formation of this new world system by taking a leadership role, and the way we do that, begin to do that, is by implementing Mr. LaRouche's four laws in the United States, which we begin with Glass-Steagall the shutting down of this British Empire system so that it can be replaced with a system around physical economic growth, a credit system, and development which is geared for the progress of mankind. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ben. I think you have a few things to say on that. Yeah. Um, thanks, Megan. And uh, yeah, today I wanted to discuss getting more at uh, some of the implications of Lynn's four points, the four laws, because as you said, um, we have the growing potential for a completely new system. There's already recognition and motion around the world that what's happening now doesn't work. The system is a genocidal system. The people running it are trying to accelerate the genocide to keep their system. And it's the potential for something completely new. Um, I think it's critical to keep coming back to Lynn's four points his four laws, that policy as a whole, because I found just in, in talking with people and the population generally, people in D.C., and frankly even a lot of scientific layers, so-called scientists, that the level of thinking is way too small. Like a lot of these people, they're, they're just way too, they've been too practical, too small thinking, and it's because people have been conditioned in 40 years of a zero growth system. We haven't done anything, you know, landed on the moon in the 60s and then, you know, then what since? I mean, it's, you know, that people have just accepted, now it's been generations of this, so people have grown up in this. They've grown up in an idea of no growth, no progress, etc. So what Lynn is putting on the table, Mr. LaRouche, and uh, the role of our organization is absolutely critical, I think, in in pushing the frontiers to where mankind can and must go in response to this crisis. Um, the fourth point, he talks about Glass-Steagall, uh, number one, has to be coupled, number two, with the national banking system. That needs to immediately then issue credit to grow the economy, federal credit for a major uh, rebuilding of the U.S. economy, major, major jobs program is the third point. And the fourth point he talks about is the um, need for a fusion driver program. So I'm going to come back to that from the standpoint of the water crisis, which is a subject we've discussed a lot. And I want to start with a global overview of the water crisis, because um, despite what some congressmen have actually literally said, uh, water is a single global system. I think in response to some of our organizing in Washington, D.C., one congressman said, well, I think we need to solve the California water crisis with California water. <laughs> Which, where does California's water come from? It doesn't come from California. It comes from the whole Pacific Ocean. It comes from the whole global system. So there's a lot of need for much uh, better scientific understanding of what we're talking about here. So Lynn is, Mr. Lewis has repeatedly emphasized the water system is a single global system. You can't, you have regional components, and you can look at the interaction of components, but if you were at the stage now, we need to start looking at a single planetary system. So the crisis, I think most people have an intuitive sense, is pretty staggering. I mean, you have two and a half billion people without access to sanitation because they don't have standard enough regular water supply. Two and a half billion people, it's a huge figure. Um, you can see somewhat here, here's a, one map that just shows the basins, the water basins, the river basins, where you have um, what they call water stress. 
the water supply available in these regions is not enough to support the human economic activity uh, occurring in those regions. So it gives kind of a general quick image of where a lot of the crisis is. And it's major. You can see it covers much of the world. Um, uh, at the same time, there are figures saying that about 800 million people don't have access to water at all, clean drinking water. Now, uh, Mr. LaRouche's intelligence magazine, EIR, Executive Intelligence Review, has looked at that a little more closely. And their view is that, well, if you set the standard a little bit higher about actually having access to water in your home in a reliable way, you know, something we'd expect as a modern standard of living today, it's more like four billion. So you might have some well plunked down in the middle of some village or maybe on the outskirts of some village, and then people will say, okay, then all those people in that village now have access to water. Well, if they have to spend all their time carrying it back and forth and all this stuff, you know, it doesn't, certainly should not limit ourselves there. So around four billion people with a lack of access to reliable, clean, safe water in their homes, four billion, it's a huge number, two and a half billion without access to san sanitation. Um, I was looking at some other figures, about a quarter of the current water use comes from groundwater, about one-fourth of the global water use. Something in that range, I think there's different organizations might have different estimations, but something in that figure. Now some groundwater supplies are fine, they get recharged as with rainfall and it's uh, nothing wrong with using it. Other regions, um, the rate of refilling of groundwater can be relatively slow. And you have a major building crisis where a number of regions are drawing down the water at a faster rate than it's being replenished. So these represent potential major crisis points because it's the rate of activity of the groundwater cycle is not quick enough to sustain the growing rate of human economic activity. So, um, and then we've also discussed, you know, specifically the crisis in the West in California. We have a major drought right now. It's getting worse. Um, uh, the Central Valley groundwater, for example, the aquifer there is depleting. And it's probably going to deplete faster because there's not as much uh, rainwater and river flows. Here's an um, image of the snowpack in winter, where a lot of the fresh water comes from. This was taken by some NASA observations. January 2013, January 2014. Mm. So it's quite dramatic, the lack of snow, snowpack that provides much of the fresh water for California. Because of this, then people are going to be forced to either abandon agriculture, not have enough water, or be forced to go from accelerated use of the groundwater in the Central Valley Aqueduct, which has already um, been consistently depleting year after year after year. They're going deeper and deeper and deeper to get the water. So it's a major crisis. And just in the past couple weeks, there's been, a lot of, there's been a lot of hope that some coming weather pattern changes might help break the drought, specifically the uh, El Nino effect, mm -hmm. where you have this periodic cycling of warm ocean water, which tends to help bring more moist air and rainfall to certain regions of the United States. And a lot of people have been very hoping that a big El Nino will help break the drought. And at this point, no one's going to sit here and forecast exactly what's going to happen. But the most recent signs are that the El Nino now is weakening. It's actually a weak El Nino. So the probability of it bringing a lot of water is significantly reduced. So the point is that this is a major crisis globally. We've discussed a lot the crisis in California, Texas, and the West. And there's no immediate sign that it's going to alleviate just on um, natural conditions. So this is what we're facing. Now, Mr. LaRouche has said what we have to do is go to a higher energy flux density program. We need to increase the energy flux density of the U.S. economy and the economies globally to ensure that mankind can manage and control the water cycles and the water systems needed to sustain human life. Um, and we've been discussing this and, and working this through. And as cited in, as we've cited in Mr. LaRouche's four points program, is four laws, 
uh, all of these policies really should be subsumed and seen from the standpoint of the scientific work of Vernotsky, Vladimir Vernotsky, and looking at the role of mankind as a more powerful force than the biosphere and a more powerful force than the solar system as a whole, potentially in the near future. And what I'm going to get at in, a, in looking at how mankind has to go into the future with address, by addressing this water crisis is really mankind beginning to take over the role of the sun on the planet Earth. That mankind must actually rise to the level of the activity of the sun itself in terms of having that level of influence and control over the global water system on the planet. So now to get into that, um, we have to have a sense of the top-down view of the global water system. So here is a schematic of what I would call the terrestrial water cycle. Because as soon as you're talking about water, you have to start talking about cycles and processes that have cyclical characteristics. It's not just a resource you're using. All of the water supplies on land are not just stores, they're cycles, they're processes. And all of the activity on land, all of the uh, snowpack, the precipitation, the lakes, the rivers, the groundwater, all of it depends ultimately on the evaporation of ocean water and the precipitation of that evaporated ocean water over the land. And this is a schematic where the, the width of the arrows is all to scale to show the, the yearly <clears throat> average flows of these different water systems for the planet as a whole. So the, o the sun evaporates a huge amount of water from the ocean, but then as you can see, the vast majority, majority of it just then falls right back down into the ocean. On average, about 10% of this water evaporated from the ocean precipitates or falls as rain or snow over land, over the continents. And that becomes the basis of the entire terrestrial water cycle thus far. Once the water's on land, you have a very, very significant factor, which is the role of plant life itself. Once the water's on land, some of it will then evaporate again and fall again as rain. So you can see this kind of added cycle um, here on, uh, on our left there. But then an even bigger factor is the role of plants directly in kind of boosting the cycle. Taking water that was brought onto land, utilizing some of it in photosynthesis, but then putting water back up into the atmosphere to then fall again as rain on land. And it was only recently that there have been some really authoritative studies on this, and by those studies it indicates that plants actually play the largest role so far in creating rainfall and precipitation on land. Um, over half of all the precipitation on average over the continents we could attribute to the actions of plant life, plant activity. So it's a very significant factor. Um, <clears throat> all these values here are just given in cubic kilometers per year. Just kind of a, just a metric to use and you can see the relative values of the different ones. And then the cycle quasi-cycle closes off with the runoff, of ocean runoff and outflow of water back into the oceans, which as you can see here generally matches a, um, a, uh, the input. Mm -hmm. So you get a general evaporation of ocean water, participates in continental cycles, gravity brings it back down into the ocean, you kind of have the concept of a closed system. It's obviously not this simple, but this is just to give a concept, give an idea. Um, now, mankind so far has played a significant role when mankind is allowed to and not held back by imperial systems and environmentalists. Mankind has played a significant role in improving and managing these existing cycles. Um, taking the existing role of solar activity and putting moisture into the continental system and improving what that water does while it's there. And the highest expression of this that I, I've seen was the 
is the design for the Nawapa system, which is something that fully could have happened, but was blocked from ever being developed by the whole environmentalist paradigm shift. And the Nawapa system depended upon, so keep this idea of an input-output cycle in your mind for a second. You're looking at water going in, and then uh, participating in the terrestrial cycles on the continents, and then flowing out. We want to pose the question of how do we, what does it do when it's there? Because if it's not doing anything, there's no point to the cycle. And how do we improve what it does? How do we make it more productive? Now, the continent of North America is an interesting case study because you have uh, what, we've been, what we've been discussing a lot on this show, which is a dramatic, and which is a major crisis right now for people, a dramatic discrepancy in the water availability in the western half of the continent. Um, not to get caught up in these figures in particular, but the, if you divide the northern half of the west and the southern half of the west, and then you just look at how much water is available, you can see that the water, the total water flow precipitation and river runoff, if you measure it by runoff, the output, in the northern half is about 10 times higher than the southern half and including if you just put it in per area terms. So the amount of water availability in the north per square kilometer, per mile, whatever, is about 10 times what's available in the south. So you have this huge discrepancy in the kind of natural state of the water system of the North American continent. And because the water, um, so what we want to look at then is how productive are these systems from that standpoint. And so we were playing around with some figures and just to kind of give, I mean, frankly, it somewhat amounts to a back of the envelope calculation, but to give uh, the right order of magnitude and concepts, we were comparing the amount of water flow to the amount of productivity of that water, the amount of photosynthesis, the amount of creation of new plant life, which is one of the critical functions of water in the whole biosphere system. So it seems like a decent proxy to measure the productivity of water. And what we found was that the northwest, this northern half that we're just referencing, which has 10 times the water availability of the southwest, um, has a relatively very low amount of productivity per water. Um, the absolute values are given on the map and the photosynthesis per amount of water is given on the chart on the left there. So you can see the blue area, the northwest, is about one million tons of plant life, of new biomass, of new photosynthesis per cubic kilometer of water flow. Just those are the terms measured, and the point is the relative comparisons, where the northwest is only one, the southwest is five times over five times higher. The water is actually five times more productive in the southwest than in the northwest. And humans have a huge influence in that through irrigation, management. This is an example of already managing an existing water cycle and improving the use and productivity of that existing cycle. And you can see that also if you take the continent as a whole, North America, the northwest is still less than half of the productivity of the whole continental system. So this northwestern region, and much of this is because of the temperature and because of the sunlight, and also because a lot of the water falls right along the coast and runs off into the ocean. So the amount of water going up there is just not able to do a whole lot. It's too cold a lot of the time. You had a higher elevation, so you don't get as much sunlight. So overall, the thing is relatively much less productive per amount of water than the continent as a whole, and especially than the southwest. So this, I think, is an interesting way to look at the proposal of the Nawapa system done in the 60s, which was to, with river diversion systems, divert 10, 15 percent of some of these rivers up north down into the southwest, into the central part of the country. Um, and this, I think, represents the highest level of managing an existing water cycle that anybody's really pr proposed and developed in depth and had some real motion, some potential of actually becoming a reality. And 
from the standpoint of our productivity measurements we were just talking about, if you take the amount of water that Nawapa calls for, and if you bring that into the southwest, we can now assume that that, that water will have the same productivity as southwest water, which was five times higher. So the total water of the whole, and then again, it will exit the system. Instead of running off in the north, it runs off in the southwest, so it re-enters the ocean. Mm -hmm. So without changing the fundamental input-output flow of our general concept here, we can actually increase the productivity of the entire continental water cycle um, by these you know, rough kind of first-order measurements by 10 to 15 percent, which is pretty damn good if you're talking about an entire continental system. Um, so this is, uh, I think, typifies the extent of the, sc uh, of the scope of thinking about managing an existing water cycle system. You have an entire continent, you look at the entire uh, precipitation input, where it goes, and the output of an entire continental system. And you say, how do we maximize the productivity and what this water does while it's on the system. And it, frankly, it'll probably be even better than these very rough initial measurements because this will bring new plant life. New plant life will increase the precipitation as we saw in the earlier graph that plant life is one of the biggest factors in increasing the water cycle. So this kind of represents a top level concept of managing an existing water cycle. But in discussions over the past couple months, Mr. LaRouche really started, and when we really started to get a serious sense of how bad the crisis in the West is, and started to look at some additional factors, Mr. LaRouche really put on the table a challenge of going to a higher level than this. Because what I've, everything I've discussed so far, what I've just presented here, has some really uh, specific assumptions being imposed on the way I've presented this right here. We're assuming some very big things which uh, you can't necessarily take for granted. The main thing is all of this is assuming you're dealing with pretty much a fixed system. All this is assuming that you have the standard input-output values that, you know, they maybe change a little bit year to year, but you're assuming you can have a standard average for the whole system. Um, you're assuming that the precipitation patterns the amount of rainfall in, in the northwest, the amount in the southwest, is relatively fixed and stable. But we are beginning to realize that's absolutely not the case. Um, just take the Colorado River, for example. I just saw this study from just a couple of years ago by the Bureau of Reclamation, where they're looking at the water flow of the Colorado River, and they compared it to they said, if you take the period from 1900 to 2000, so this is the period when uh, the major water projects in the West were built. And this is the period when you had um, discussion of how to allocate the Colorado, how much to California, how much to Mexico, how much to Arizona, et cetera. They were dealing with a flow of the Colorado of about um, 20 cubic kilometers per year. That's if we didn't take any of the water at all, that's how much would flow out into the ocean. So the, the measure it in terms of that, obviously, we'd take a lot of it out. And at this point, it doesn't even reach the ocean most of the time. Um, but the flow of the Colorado represents about 20 cubic kilometers per year. That's the average they measured between 1900 and 2000. But then if they just looked at between 2001 and 2011, this recent decade, it's uh, only 15. It's 25% less. You know, this is a river basin that supports um, 16,000 square kilometers of irrigation. This is a river basin that supports 40 million people. And all of a sudden, this past decade, the water availability in this river basin is 25% less than what it had been over the past century. It's a very significant factor, especially for a region that's already stressed and doesn't have enough water to start with. Mm -hmm. Now this actually coheres with something that has um, uh, come up in a recent book called The West Without Water, where a couple of 
uh, professors looked at the long-term records of the water availability in the West, and by a number of different um, proxy records and investigations, they came to the conclusion that the water availability in California and the West over the past century has actually been much higher and much more stable than the, a much longer period, the last couple thousand years. So, and that this Colorado example might be a perfect illustration of the type of thing we're talking about, where when we built our irrigation systems, when we built our dams, our reservoirs, we built them under the assumption we had a certain amount of availability. But it turns out, just by natural fluctuations, the value actually fluctuates much more, and we could have periods of much less, and prolonged periods of much less. So this typifies, so already we know we can't just take the standard assumption that this is just a fixed system. How we've experienced it is how it's going to be in the future, and we can just operate off that alone. Uh, one of the major factors driving the changes uh, of climate and precipitation patterns is that you know pesky small little thing out in the distance there, the sun, mm -hmm. the, the driving force of the whole solar system. You know, as we saw in the, in the conceptual infographic in the beginning, the sun drives the entire precipitation cycle. The entire continental water cycle is driven by solar activity. You know, plants may increase it, they may boost it, but if the sun wasn't providing the initial input, they wouldn't be able to do anything. So it makes a lot of sense to say, well, when the sun changes, what is that going to do to our water cycle? What is that going to do to the precipitation patterns? What's that going to do to water availability? And we've gone through this on some of these shows in the past. I'm not going to take too much time to, to go into the details of this, but we know the sun changes a lot. We know the sun changes on a roughly decadal cycle, every 11 years or so. But we know that that's your standard, you refer to as the solar cycle. But we also know that over a longer period, say the past thousand years, as represented in this graph, the sun goes through decadal changes over a series of many decades and over centuries. So whereas each 11 years or so you have one cycle of more activity, less activity, over a longer period, how active any of those cycles are changes a lot. And we, can me we know that, we can measure that by records left by the amount of cosmic radiation galactic cosmic radiation, radiation coming from outside of our solar system. The amount of that radiation coming from the galaxy, coming into our solar system, is affected by how active the sun is. So when the sun is less active, it has a, uh, the, the magnetic field is not as strong, and it doesn't shield this galactic cosmic radiation coming in to the sun, coming into the, the whole solar system, including intersecting the Earth. So during periods of low solar activity, we have increased effects of cosmic radiation. So that's what they're measuring here. So what you have is a series of these minimums. Probably the most famous one is the Maunder minimum, whereas where when we looked at the record of cosmic radiation, galactic cosmic radiation, we see that it spiked, it went way up, which tells us that the sun must have been less active to allow more of this cosmic radiation to come in. And we see that that's happened periodically. Every two to four hundred years or so, you tend to get these periods of very low solar activity. So these are generally called grand minimums, the Maunder minimum, the Spohr minimum, the Wolf minimum, the Oort minimum. These are a series of major solar minimums that have occurred over the past thousand years. Now, what's come out now in a series of studies is that corresponding to these periods of grand minimum, low solar activity, you do see significant changes in the amount of, uh, in the precipitation patterns, in the global uh, water moisture cycle. Um, just to pull out a few of these, here's an example of precipitation in Tibet, in the Tibet Plateau, um, measured against these solar cycles. 
And you see every time you have one of these major minimums, you get a major drop in the amount of precipitation measured, measured by these records in this one location in China. You have um, multiple other studies looking at other regions in um, Asia and South Asia, also showing a similar thing during this Maunder minimum period, this most recent period of major solar weakening, you had increased, uh, you had a weakening of the monsoon, less precipitation, less water available, corresponding to lower solar activity. Uh, similar things in, measured in the Yucatan Peninsula. Increased drought, uh, less water available um, during the Maunder minimum period. Multiple other studies in the Caribbean, Caribbean and Central Asian, Central American regions. Three other studies looking at different areas, again showing the same thing. Uh, drier conditions generally corresponding to this weak solar activity period. And then here's kind of a just quick plotting of a number of these studies. So here you have five, ten different studies at different regions of the planet all corresponding to lower um, uh, water flow, drier conditions during periods of weak solar activity. Uh, other regions of the globe, I'm not going to go into all the details here, show different uh, responses. In the north, you tend to get cooling. It, tend to get, it tends to get colder during periods of low solar activity. Multiple studies, Russia, England, Europe, all indicate cooling during weak solar activity. In the equator, Specifically, their studies indicate you might get more moisture, you get more rainfall. So some people have theorized that perhaps for some reason during periods of weak solar activity, the atmosphere system isn't able to move tropical moisture north as much, north and south into the subtropics, which is indicated by this yellow band here. That's one theory. There might be more things involved. But the point of all this is, you know, we, we, we have these records of the West in California, just talked about the Colorado River being 25% less than it was. This is all during a period where the sun hasn't been doing a whole lot of changing. Now we have indications that the sun could be very likely heading into a major weakening period of the type we haven't seen in at least 200 years, perhaps of the type we haven't seen in 400 years. And we have many indications that this type of weakening, major solar weakening, does have dramatic effects on the precipitation patterns, on the moisture flows, on temperature, on climate. So we are very, very far from a uh, fixed system we're dealing with. We can't just take some fixed value of input-output, some fixed idea of where the water falls and where it isn't, and just build a system simply off that. Because we have indications that these things change, they can change dramatically, and they can change on a time scale of decades. So we need to go, as Mr. LaRouche challenged the basement team with, we need to go to a higher level of addressing the global water crisis. And, you know, we've discussed a few of these things, and we've, we've gone through some of this, so I'm going to do this kind of quickly, but one major thing is uh, weather modification with these ionization technologies. Um, went through this in detail in a few, uh, few weeks ago in, in a couple of these shows, but there's been systems that have operated in Mexico for a number of years which have significantly increased the rainfall through a method of increasing the ionization of the atmosphere, a process that was able to help draw in moisture from over the oceans and induce atmospheric moisture to condense and form as rainfall. So we've had significant evidence that these things have been quite successful in Mexico over the past decade. There was smaller scale but very significant studies done in Australia where they, with similar technologies, showed that you can increase the rainfall, increase the precipitation with these types of systems. Um, another company, um, Medio Systems, has done similar activity in the United Arab Emirates. And also recently, there's been some papers on uh, new activity in uh, Israel uh, with these types of systems. 
So we have an indication that mankind could begin to actually modulate and manipulate flows of moisture in the atmosphere. And we could begin to uh, control when it falls and where it falls, which obviously would be a critical handle over the types of changes that we're just talking about. If we, if we can't assume that the natural precipitation patterns and moisture flows are going to remain the same, they're going to vary with solar activity and vary with other natural fluctuations, then how can we give mankind a grasp and influence over controlling where those moisture cycles go, controlling where the precipitation patterns occur? And we definitely have at least one avenue to investigate with these ionization technologies. There should be more things that should be looked into. You know, it should be put as a real challenge to nations. If we're going to have security over our water, we need to begin to look at how to have an influence on climate, on precipitation, on weather. You know, beyond just some playing around with cloud seeding, but looking at some more interesting, you know, specifically electrical and ionization direction. Be looking at more of these um, uh, electrical and magnetic type properties you can begin to play with. Um, the other big, the other significant input that will have to be dramatically accelerated is desalination, is converting ocean water, salty ocean water, to fresh water. Now this is, um, again, we live in a context where there's been 40 years of no progress. You know, Kennedy was talking about major desalination systems large-scale systems saying nuclear power, desalination, we can begin to address all of our problems with these things. That was just cut off and we've sat with, you know, no progress for 40 years. So unfortunately a lot of the discussion around desalination is still very pessimistic. It's too expensive, it's too energy intensive, it's too difficult, you know, uh, which is just a load of, uh, of junk. Uh, we were, I was looking at, again, just some back-of-the-envelope calculations and um, it, one way to look at this is with Mr. LaRouche's concept of energy flux density. And one way you can look at energy, the energy flux density of a national economy is by the power per capita, the energy consumed per year per person average for your whole nation. So this doesn't just mean how much energy do I use in my home every day. It means how much energy is used to... Um, power the industries, to provide the food, to transport my food, to power the servers that my computers use, whatever. How much energy is used for the national economy as a whole? Um, and then how is that, uh, what's the per capita value of that? And we've seen historically over the history of the United States, for example, with the succession to higher levels of energy sources, more energy dense forms of uh, fuels. We see this continual growth in the energy use, the power per capita of the US economy. But then again, as we just discussed, you see the stagnation, the flatlining and the collapse starting around 1970 when nuclear power was not allowed to be developed, it was suppressed and fusion power was suppressed dramatically. So instead of the natural growth process, which should have and could have occurred, we've had this flatlining. You know, here's just an example of a few projections of the uh, energy per capita growth estimated by the Kennedy administration. So that C value there. Um, our own estimate of A, if we had a full fission and then full fusion driver program, uh, we would expect something more in the range of 20 to 25 kilowatts per capita. Now we're at 10. Um, Executive Intelligence Review did a study which showed similar results uh, around the 80s. When they were looking at what would the SDI, Mr. LaRouche's Strategic Defense Initiative program, done to drive the whole economy forward. So if you look at energy flux density, energy per capita, um, you look at where we're at now and where we should be and where we need to go in a, in a healthy growing economy 
And then if you look at desalination from that standpoint, it's actually relatively little. Um, we're now at about 10 kilowatts per capita, 10,000 watts per capita. If we were to provide all of our water use with desalination, uh, everything except for cooling of power plants, which you wouldn't need to desalinate water just to use water to cool power plants, you know, it's not. But uh, everything from the water use for mining, the water use for industry, the water use for agriculture, all agricultural water use, um, the water use for just your domestic and public supplies, all of the water use in the United States could be provided with about um, 325 watts per capita of desalination. That is, um, right now we're at about 10,000 watts or 10 kilowatts. This would be 300, about 325 watts per capita. So like a 30th of our current per capita energy use. To put that into perspective, uh, we have a total use of 10,000 watts per capita. We average about 3,000 watts per capita use just for transportation on average. So just the, what we accept as the regular cost of moving around, moving ourselves around, moving our food around, just transportation needs, is almost a third of our um, per capita energy use as a national economy. If we want to provide all of our water, current water use with desalination, it would be like a tenth of that. So you put these relative scales, it's not necessarily a whole lot. Um, then obviously we wouldn't need to do that. We don't need to just replace all of our water uses, everything with desal. That's not what we're saying we need to do, but just to put it into perspective, you know, relative to even the existing levels, it's not necessarily a whole lot. If we'd gone to 15, 20, 30 watts per capita with a full fission, full fusion economy, you could physically afford these types of things. Your relationship to natural resources is completely different. We're now at an energy flux density level of our national economy where we can afford on a large scale to provide water to do these types of things um, with desalination, with weather modification, uh, with these types of, uh, of systems. So now but the point of all this is, you kind of went through uh, a lot of specifics here, but the point is what this is mankind um, uh, really taking over for the role of the sun on the planet Earth. That's, that's what we're talking about. That's, I think, how Vernotsky would look at it if he were alive today examining this. He would say, we're looking at with uh, desalination and with weather modification, we're looking at mankind actually creating his own cycles which didn't exist before. And you can see it in, you know, kind of illustrated in a cartoonish way here, but this illustrates in a very significant principle. You have, as we saw before, the entire continental water system was solely powered by the sun. And as we then developed, that's not constant, that's changing, that fluctuates. It fluctuates in quantity, it fluctuates in distribution. So it's not just a fixed input-output system, but it's a changing system. So now if mankind is going to take over for the role of this weakening sun, this get, sun's getting lazy, it's wanting us to pick up the slack a little bit, you know, the noosphere needs to come into action to ensure that the global water cycle, the global terrestrial water cycle is robust, accelerating, developing, and productive. Um, we can do that with weather modification and desalination. We're actually, we're actually increasing the input into the continental systems. With weather modification, we're actually drawing in moisture from over the oceans, which wouldn't precipitate over land normally. And we can bring it over land. We can increase the input into the terrestrial system. With desalination, we're uh, even going into some degree a step farther by actually the sun itself is doing desalination all the time by evaporating the water. Mm -hmm. We could begin to provide our own power source to do that ourselves and power a whole new cycle, creating a whole, whole new cycle. Um, and then with this type of activity and with the uh, good management of these cycles, you increase the plant life, you increase the, the precipitation that plants provide, 
So you can overall increase then the productivity and the, and the activity of these existing uh, cycles. And then obviously all that is going to increase the runoff. This is not just use, this is a cyclical system. And quite frankly, the Colorado River should be running off into the ocean. It should be taking salts and stuff from the soils. It should be flowing into the ocean again. The Rio Grande River should be flowing into the ocean again. These, these river systems, where we're just tapping them out and uh, taking all the water and they're not reaching the river again, that's not something we should just leave as is. But the solution is not to stop using the water. The solution is to mankind play the role as a creative force for the noosphere to act in uh, augmenting and creating new cycles that will support the Colorado, that will support the Rio Grande. And again, really, this is quite literally mankind taking on the role of the sun. This is mankind saying, as a creative force on the planet, the power of human thought, the power of human culture, what Vernatsky called uh, human culture a, a new form of energy in the biosphere on the planetary system. By employing this higher capability, mankind is quite literally beginning to take over for the sun in controlling these types of systems. And then, you know, as we've discussed a lot, it obviously doesn't end on Earth. I mean, moving out into space, asteroid defense, beginning to manage these pesky asteroids and comets. You know, this is mankind beginning to play the role of, that had been solely given to the sun in the past. And now mankind is beginning to exert himself as a uh, solar force, so to speak, on the level of stars, on the level of suns. And I think it's no coincidence that this also corresponds and is um, powered by going to a fusion economy, which is, again, harnessing the power of the sun uh, with fusion in a controlled way on Earth. So I think, you know, our challenge, I think, is to put these, um, this level of thinking on the table. And, you know, we're facing a breakdown of the existing system. But especially in the United States, people have been so conditioned to thinking so small. The critical, you know, we could see the collapse of the United States just by letting people follow their own assumptions at this point. <laughs> you know, the oligarchy's created kind of a, uh, it's created itself in the way people think. Mm -hmm. And if we don't attack that and challenge people around these ideas of environmentalism, the green ideology, the hatreds of people actually taking an active role in improving and developing the planet, you know, we're not going to have a recovery in the United States. These other nations might move forward, but we're going nowhere but down at this point. And so I think our role is critical in challenging people with the top-down conception of what is, as Mr. LaRouche put in this four point four laws presentation, from the scientific perspective of Vernatsky, what is mankind's role and mission on the planet over the coming generations and beyond into the solar system. So I think this water example is just one aspect, one critical illustration of this more general principle. It actually is even a little worse than you have posed it because uh, rather than just a fixed cycle, most people think of uh, the whole drought situation, for example, as just having less water. Right. And so even what you presented of uh, the global system is more than the way that most people think. It's already bigger than what most people think of. And so being able to think of themselves as controlling that is already, is already pretty big. But of course the, point, the, the main point to point out is that uh, the global system, the globe is not, real, is not isolated. Mm -hmm. It is a very small part of a huge solar system which gets all of its energy from the sun mm -hmm. and more and, and the galaxy possibly. And so, uh, one, yes, it, it's, it, is the, uh, it is the ability to control it as a system, but I think the, the point you're making the point that you uh, elaborated at the end is the main issue that our population has, mm -hmm. which is our own conception of ourselves. And using that, having that, that, the right conception to the point where 
uh, it creates a necessity for development. Because I think you know, it is very, I'm not exactly sure what to say about the fact that our own visionaries right now don't have a very far vision. Yeah. Visionary, their vision is, is very, very nearsighted. It's, they're yeah. very nearsighted. And even the ones that think, think very, very far out in time are still taking a, a linear extrapolation of the type of growth we have now and extending that. Or even something that we had previously in extending that. But that doesn't have a, a, a that type of extrapolation doesn't have a principle behind it. It doesn't have a principle of uh, what mankind's ultimate role in its, ex it, or what mankind's existence is actually for. And that's not a, you know, it's not something that's very simple. It is something that has to be continually investigated and I'm not gonna say that I know what that is, but I do know that um, the way, what we've discussed is much, much higher than a lot of other people's who, uh, who should be investigating that exact question, especially people who are leaders in society. If you're a leader of society and you don't know what society's purpose is, that is a problem. Yeah, just yeah. thinking about the work of Vernatsky, you know, he was living, he dies right around the time of the end of World War II. And he writes in, the in 1945, he writes a very small work called Some Words on the Noosphere, something along those lines. Now you think this is after World War I, where you know, most of the culture was, and, and Vernowski himself, was reeling from the destructive power that man was able to exert for the first time with the technological capability of that war, and then what was continued in World War II. Most of the, the European and, and world's population was actually entering a real cult period of cultural pessimism. Mm -hmm. Now Vernowski says, okay, however, this is a sign that for the first time, man is able to exert powers on a planetary force that demonstrate to me that we've entered the age of the noosphere. And what he means by the age of the noosphere is that the, the thoughts and the work of civilization, of mankind for the first time, are becoming the dominant force which is organizing the growth of the biosphere on the planet. And you know, Ben, you exhibited that beautifully in, in between the two graphics. First, the graphic where the sun is the main driver of the water cycle, and then you, in the second one where you begin to see man accelerating the water cycle. This is exactly how Vernatsky concluded or that you have to actually measure the development of the biosphere and then of man's activity. He points out that the action of life on the material of the planet has been to, over time, has been to accelerate the movement of materials through the different um, met metabolic cycles and that over evolutionary time, the rate of movement of materials and hence the state of organization of the biosphere has been increasing. And he points out that for the first time with man, do you see the rate of increase within a single generation because of the activity of technology, because of the activity of science. And that's exactly what you see with the example of the water cycle, that man accelerates the change in the development of the biosphere. And that you know, Vernatsky concludes even in this very, um, this period of great trauma to civilization, this is the natural role of mankind. This is the natural, this is the, the state of nature and that the development of the biosphere had been vectored toward creating a creature such as mankind that could actually begin to exert scientific thought as the dominant force over, he wasn't limited to the planet, but the planet and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like, in that sense, the, the water cycle example it is very good, but it's slightly deceiving because it's not just increasing the water cycle, mm -hmm. which uh, I realize there are actually a, a few that we can add, which is internal, because we also can desalinate oh, yeah. water internally yeah, sure. and so on, and also uh, moving the weather, moving the water within the land. But... Um, but the other aspect is this idea of creating a state of organization that's higher. Mm -hmm. And because that is really the, the, the qualitative or even quantitative aspect of why we do these things or why those are, are, are considered higher order processes. Yeah, it really it sustains a higher anti-entropic stage. Mm -hmm. You look at the 
I think one of the, the history of life is a great example of this. You, know, you have an increase in the biogenic migration of atoms. You have an increase of the carbon cycle, an increase of the oxygen cycle. You have an increase in the energy use you know, per organism. But the point of all that is to support a whole higher level system, more advanced organisms, more developed animals, leading up to the ability to create a system which could support then a form of willful creative expression, you know, qualitatively different than the animals, which is human activity. But yeah, you know, it's, it's all governed by uh, the, you know, one of the biggest things that people have a difficulty with is what Mr. LaRouche, again, put in this four-point memo, memo quite explicitly, which is mankind is the measure of the earth and the solar system. Mm -hmm. We have to govern our actions by measuring what are the needs and activity and relationship of the noosphere to the biosphere and the solar system as a whole. And if you ever try and take it any step lower than that, you're not going to be able to define competent policy. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to define uh, with any competent scientific basis what's uh, appropriate and right for the actions of nations and economies. Right, because you're always going to be influenced externally without knowing it. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, se it, does, it does seem like this, um, even this example, taking control of the water cycle would be a prelude, a necessary one, to space development. Mm -hmm. So now you're taking on even a larger system. I mean, obviously, understanding this this system requires uh, a solar system view. But once you try, try to take on the solar system, then you have to take a galactic view. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like this point that you guys are both making about man taking over the role of the sun. And it, it really does neatly um, draw together this whole period from the Renaissance until now in mm -hmm. which you had the emergence of the system of nation-state governments. In the Renaissance, because of the work of Cusa and then the following work of Kepler, for the first time man was able to conquer the solar system with his mind mm -hmm. and actually turn the solar, the, the movements of the stars and the, the, the planets and the sun into a single system which was created as a thought of man and which was valid over which he could potentially exert power. And now we see the you know, if we, if we survive this <laughs> current political period, we see the potential of man physically taking over the role of the sun, physically controlling the sun and taking over and, and becoming more powerful in his implementation of, in, in his administration of those functions of the sun than the sun itself. And then obviously, as you said, then as soon as we do that, what does it imply? The galaxy, mm -hmm. the entire galactic system that encompasses the sun. And I think that just really does neatly draw this whole period together because in that whole historical development you also had the emergence of the system of nation-state governments mm -hmm. which was then oppressed by this oligarchical empire system that we're fighting today and if man can get free and uh, of this empire system of the current British Empire and fully manifest this ever in, you know um, this pro this nation-state government and a world system of nation-state governments which are actually oriented toward this development of the solar system, that's the natural condition of man. Mm -hmm. The empire is unnatural. And, and the natural condition of man is to do exactly what we've been discussing today. Absolutely. OK. I think that's a good place to leave it for today. Yeah. Uh, I do just want to tell our viewers that the next couple of weeks are going to be crucial in terms of this political fight. The Congress is in Washington, D.C. until the end of July. They're going to be out for the rest of the summer and who knows how long beyond. So the next weeks are critical and as we saw from the mobilization against the war in Syria last year, the population absolutely plays a crucial role in forcing Congress's hand. So we need people to do is get on, you know, go to the LaRouche Pack website homepage, get the contact information, contact your local office and see what you can do to get involved in the mobilization. Mm -hmm. We have teams on the ground right now of activists and organizers in Washington, D.C. with banner rallies, meetings in the Congress and so on. So we need people to do everything you can to, to join the mobilization and make the breakthrough immediately. Mm -hmm. So with that, thank you for watching and we'll see everybody next week.